Well, thank you for thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I am a member of Podemos. I've been for nearly a year, but I'm not speaking here as a member of Podemos. So anything that I say is not the official position of Podemos. is is my position as a Marxist in uh, in Podemos. I will try to explain. Uh, the background to the rise of both Syriza and Podemos, which I think is uh, important, is uh, relevant not only for Spain and Greece, but is relevant for wider uh, for, for for activists uh, everywhere. You know, because uh, these are two of the countries where the crisis of capitalism that we are living through has uh, affected in a harshest uh, way. And I would say that these two countries, Spain and Greece, and Greece, are the two countries where the political impact of the crisis of capitalism has been more developed. I.e., the countries where a larger number of people have drawn more advanced political conclusions about this question. But this is part of a more general process. What is happening in Greece and Spain is not specific of Greece and Spain, although obviously there are national peculiarities. But it's part of a more general process that is happening uh, everywhere in, in the whole of the advanced capitalist uh, countries, in one degree or another. But uh, the arrow is all pointing in the same direction. And therefore, it is useful to study the cases of those countries where the process has gone further, because I think we can learn and draw conclusions for, for our work in other parts. I will also try to explain what, in my opinion, are some of the limitations of Syriza and uh, Podemos. There has been a lot of talk of people saying this is a new form of politics, this is something new that should be repeated uh, everywhere, and it's also worth analyzing it uh, critically, what, in my opinion, are some of the limitations, both in the politics, in the form of organization, and, and so on, so that we can learn some uh, lessons. Um, I also like to say that I have prepared a small PowerPoint presentation with some figures, but this is the first time I've done a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm not sure whether this will, will be helpful or it will come out all wrong, uh, but bear, bear with me. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, in, in, in Spain and Greece, you could say, it's not, not, the, not maybe the two countries where the crisis of capitalism has hit hardest, but two of the ones that it has hit hardest. You, you could put uh, other countries like uh, Portugal, Ireland, perhaps even uh, Italy in the same uh, category. But what is true is that since the capitalist crisis uh, started in uh, 2008, there has been a massive collapse of the economy in these two countries. In the case of Greece, this is the worst collapse of the economy. It's uh, worse than what we saw in the 1929 uh, crash of, the, of, of capitalism, which up until now was the biggest crisis in the history of uh, capitalism. So that's something. In Greece, you could say that approximately uh, 20 to 30 percent of the GDP has been knocked out. And they haven't even recovered uh, up until this point. There is some talk that the Greek economy is starting to recover, is starting to grow. But as you can see from the figures, it's still uh, very much down from the point it was at the beginning of the, of the, of the crisis. Uh, but also this is the case of uh, Spain, where the Spanish government has been talking for a few months of uh, the fact that Spain is now the country in Europe which has the fastest growing uh, economy. But yes, it is growing uh, fast. It's, not, it's, it's, it's growing fast. It's also uh, continuing with massive inequality in the distribution of uh, wealth. But at the same time, as you can see from these figures, is nowhere near recovering the level of, of industrial production, the level of economic uh, activity that we had before the, the crisis. And this is uh, nearly six full years after the beginning of the <laughs> crisis. If you look at the history of uh, capitalism, obviously capitalism moves in uh, booms and slumps, in recoveries and recessions. This is a normal cycle of the life of uh, capitalism. But you will be very hard pressed to find another crisis that has been so long uh, lasting and the consequences of which haven't even uh, finished uh, yet. And most bourgeois economists are now talking of what they describe as secular stagnation, i.e. that even when capitalism finally comes out of this uh, crisis, which it will at some uh, point, 
the perspective is not one of sustained economic uh, growth, but one of uh, at most sluggish economic growth with ma maintaining uh, austerity policies, high levels of unemployment or underemployment, very casualized conditions in work and, uh, and so on. Uh, this obviously is not just, uh, these are the cold uh, figures, cold economic figures of the economic uh, collapse. But this obviously has had a whole number of uh, important consequences, a massive change in the living conditions of millions of, uh, of uh, people. In uh, both Greece and Spain there has been a massive rise in uh, unemployment. In the case of Greece, uh, overall unemployment has uh, trebled and youth unemployment has more than uh, doubled. These uh, figures were at one point uh, youth unemployment in both Greece and Portugal uh, reached nearly 60 percent of, uh, of the population, this the, of the youth. This means that uh, out of every uh, three or out of every three uh, young uh, persons two will be uh, unemployed. And this is without counting the fact that hundreds of thousands of young people, uh, particularly people with uh, high qualifications, with university degrees, speaking different languages, have been forced to emigrate uh, for the first time in two generations. Uh, in the case of Spain, there was a big migration uh, wave back in the 1950s, 1960s, but uh, for, most of the, for most of the 20th century, Spain had been a net recipient of uh, immigrant uh, workers. And now, for the first time since the beginning of the, cri the crisis, uh, hundreds of thousands of youth and, and not so young people have had to emigrate to other countries to look for jobs because there's nothing in, uh, in, in, uh, because there's nothing to be, uh, nothing to be found. And you have to understand that also this situation comes uh, after a period in which it seemed that there was certain economic uh, growth, that the living conditions of the majority of people were improving, although the situation before this crisis was not brilliant uh, for most uh, people, but at least there were jobs. There were lots of jobs uh, around. One could find a job, maybe not a very good job, but one could find a job, maybe uh, have some prospects for the, for the future. As you can see, in both countries, Unemployment was at a very low uh, level of eight, uh, of around eight percent, and all of a sudden it's jumped uh, massively. In a country like Spain, there are now 1.8 million households where there's no income at all. Pe there's people are not receiving uh, any. There's none of the members of the family is uh, employed and none of the members of the family are receiving any sort of unemployment uh, benefit, which in Spain is only limited in, uh, in time what you can uh, receive. We're talking about a uh, massive rise in the levels of uh, poverty in what is basically advanced capitalist uh, countries in, uh, in uh, Europe. According to Eurostat, uh, the European official statistics uh, institution, people at risk of poverty and social uh, exclusion 35% uh, of the population in Greece, we're talking about millions of uh, people, and 27% in uh, Spain. Children uh, living under the poverty, in, in households under the poverty level, are 40% in Greece, 33% in uh, Spain. Obviously, the way that these figures are calculated is different and, uh, and, and much can be said for, for this, but what is clear is that this situation didn't exist before the, the crisis. I also added this uh, picture. This could be Athens, but it's in fact uh, Madrid, where hundreds of thousands of people are now forced to look through the rubbish bins to find food to eat on a daily uh, basis. And this is a situation that didn't exist in uh, countries like Spain and Greece before, or it was limited to a small amounts of uh, people. Now what you can see is that the people who are looking through the rubbish bins are people who only yesterday had a job, maybe they had a roof over their heads, they've been evicted from their homes, or maybe they, ha they still have a job today, uh, but they are up to their necks in uh, debt and they have uh, not enough money to basically uh, buy the basic uh, daily uh, subsistence. Uh, and this is a big change in, the, in uh, the living conditions of millions of people, as, uh, as I said uh, before. And, uh, and this has been uh, accompanied 
uh, by the implementation of massive austerity cuts, cuts in uh, education spending, cuts in healthcare spending, cuts in base, uh, massive sucking public sector workers, a downward pressure on uh, wages. In the case of Greece, for instance, the minimum wage went down from 751 uh, euros to around 538 uh, euros in one uh, go. And the minimum wage for young people is below that uh, level. But in both countries there has been enormous pressure to destroy collective bargaining agreements, for instance, which have been destroyed in uh, Greece. But in Spain they also implemented what is called uh, uh, labor law reform, which in reality is a counter reform, which means that uh, the, the rights that workers had to organize and negotiate collectively with the employers to get better conditions and to defend the existing conditions have been completely destroyed. About one year ago there was a wave of strikes in uh, Spain, most of them indefinite all-out strikes, which are not the usual thing in, in uh, Spanish industrial relations. And these strikes uh, were mainly caused by the decision of uh, several companies to either sack a third or 50% or of the workforce, or force the workforce to accept 30% uh, wage cuts, or even in some cases 50% uh, wage cuts. And, and obviously, faced with this situation, even with very high levels of unemployment, whole groups of workers decided to go on uh, an, an all-out indefinite strike. In some cases they won, in some other cases they were defeated. But uh, this just gives you an idea of the type of uh, pressure and all-out assault on uh, the conditions uh, of working people and the gains that had been made by workers and working people in these countries for, for basically 50 or 60 uh, years. Uh, and and this, uh, at the same time, this has been carried out under the argument that uh, there's a massive uh, state uh, debt, there's a massive deficit in the state budget, and therefore this debt must be paid and uh, this debt must be paid through massively cutting uh, uh, the, the social spending so that we can pay the debt uh, back. Now, if, even if you take this argument at face uh, value, which uh, I don't uh, accept, but if you take this argument at face value, you can see that the policies implemented, the austerity policies implemented for the last six years, particularly since 2009 or 2010, particularly in the case of Greece, have completely failed in their stated aim of uh, cutting down, the, reducing the deficit and uh, reducing the national uh, debt and, uh, and uh, getting uh, some, some recovery for the, for the economy. The, the economies of Spain and, uh, and Greece are not, re are not recovering by any uh, stretch of imagination and uh, the, the amount of the national uh, debt has massively increased during the implementation of these massive uh, cuts. In the case of Greece, this is particularly uh, the case where, where the debt before debt to GDP ratio before the crisis was 107%, is now 183%. Uh, and it has particularly increased during the implementation of massive uh, austerity cuts. In the case of Spain, it's even worse because the state debt was very low for European standards. It was only 40, was below 40% 40 in 2007. You remember the, if you, if you remember the Maastricht criteria for the European Union, there was one of the criteria was that debt to GDP ratio should be below 60%. So, so in the case of Spain, it was quite healthy from a capitalist uh, point of view, and is now nearly a hundred percent. And there is one uh, explanation for this, and the explanation is that despite all the talk that we all have to tighten up our belts and uh, the situation is bad, we all have to make sacrifices. In reality, the policy of the governments in both countries and in most countries around Europe has been to make the workers pay for the crisis of capitalism, and in fact there is a direct correlation between the increase in the national debt and uh, the money that has been transferred from the state funds directly into the banks and the capitalist uh, companies. In the case of Spain, this is uh, very clearly quantifiable because the amount of money that has been used in the bailout of the banks is exactly the amount of money that the state uh, national debt has increased uh, by, by the same uh, uh, amount. Uh, 
And this, obviously, all these different uh, uh, things that have happened, this massive change, very radical and drastic change in the living conditions of uh, millions of people, that has, has happened in a very short space of time, have had a profound impact on the consciousness of millions of, uh, of uh, people. We, we as Marxists, and one of the basic uh, ideas that Marx uh, developed, is that uh, social being determines uh, consciousness. The way that people uh, think, the way that people relate in uh, politics and in the, the relationship with society in general, is in the last instance, not, not necessarily directly and in an automatic way, but in the last instance is determined by the living conditions. And changes in, the living, in their living conditions produce big changes in the way people think about society and, and so on. Normally, the institutions of bourgeois democracy, i.e. the parliament, uh, the Supreme Court of Justice, uh, Congress, uh, the government, uh, the fact that there are elections every four years and so on, this is normally accepted by uh, the majority of people and people think that this is uh, democratic. I mean, after all, every four years or every five years you can vote for one set of politicians or another set of politicians and you can change policy by participating in the elections and, and these institutions have always existed and this we know it's a lie. As a matter of fact, you can elect whatever group of politicians you want. Uh, the people who decide policies are the big uh, capitalists and the big uh, bankers. But this is not obviously apparent in normal times. But in times like this, when there's a big crisis of capitalism, uh, people start to think about these things and people start to question these things. Maybe they don't know what is the answer, maybe they don't know what is the alternative, but millions of people in Spain and uh, Greece, but also in uh, Britain and in France and in Germany and in uh, Italy, have started to question a, whether the capitalist system is a system that works as an economic system that can guarantee better living uh, standards, that if you work hard you can maybe provide your family with a roof over, uh, over your head and a better education for your children and so on. Uh, but also two, whether the political institutions really work in the way this, they uh, allegedly uh, work. And this is... Um, particularly the case in those countries that have been subject to bailouts or so-called uh, bailouts like uh, Ireland, Portugal and Greece and to a certain extent in Spain where there was only a partial uh, bailout of the, of the banks uh, because people can see that there are certain uh, memorandums that have been signed by the national government and the Troika and these, me these memorandums uh, supersede any the democratic will of the people, which is supposed to be the basis of the bourgeois democracy. In the case of uh, Greece, there have been two memorandums of, uh, of understanding, and it's basically clear that whatever the Greek people decide in uh, elections doesn't matter, because the people who decide the policies is the Troika. And in the case of uh, Portugal, it was even uh, more extreme uh, realization of this, because it was just before the election, few months before the election, when the memorandum was signed with the Troika uh, by a government that was going to be defeated anyway in the elections. But it didn't matter what government was uh, elected because the memorandum had already been signed and had to be Im implemented. So the fact that capitalists are the ones who decide becomes more clear to uh, a larger number of, uh, of people during the, during the crisis. And, and you can produce uh, statistics for both countries, but also for many other countries, where you can see that uh, the, the, the level of trust, public opinion trust in uh, politicians, in judges, in all the official institutions of bourgeois democracy is at the rock uh, bottom. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the case of uh, Spain, for Spain, for instance, all institutions uh, miss, they, they have a level of mistrust of about 75, 80, uh, 80 percent, unheard of uh, levels of mistrust in the bourgeois uh, institutions, uh, and this is the direct consequence of these economic facts that we that we've been uh, explaining, and obviously it reaches a point. When, when such a severe crisis of capitalism uh, hits, the first reaction of most people is to say, to be surprised, to be shocked. They don't particularly like what's happening, 
but th there is a certain tendency of looking for the road of least uh, resistance. Pe people don't jump out on the streets and uh, start manning uh, barricades just uh, every, uh, every Monday morning as they wake up. It takes some time for consciousness to uh, transform. And there was a strong idea at the be beginning of the crisis, 2008-2009, that well this is bad, this is really bad and plus we are paying and uh, we're bailing out the banks but we're not bailing out the people but this is not going to last for very long and after a few uh, years, perhaps a few months, 18 months of austerity or two years of austerity there will be a recovery and things will go back to normal human consciousness is extremely conservative and we tend to cling to what we know to traditions to what has always been and, and so on uh, but it reached the point where people said enough the people said enough is enough and there were big mobilizations both in Spain and in uh, Greece. I put here this picture. This picture is from uh, 2011 and the beginning of the 15M uh, movement, also known as, as the movement of the indignados, the enraged, uh, the angry uh, people, uh, where at the initiative of a small number of uh, young uh, people, there were a number of uh, calls for demonstrations, there's another interesting point that people were inspired by what? what where, this, where did this idea come that if you occupy a square, in this case uh, Sol Square in uh, the center of Madrid, if you occupy a square you can get some change. Well this idea came directly from the Arab uh, Revolution. If you remember, this is, uh, we're talking here about uh, 15M, that was the 15th of, uh, was it March or May? Was it? May. May, 15th of May, sorry. <laughs> of uh, 2011. In January and February the people of uh, Tunisia and uh, Egypt had overthrown the dictatorships or the regimes in those countries, very powerful uh, regimes with uh, heavy repressive apparatus by coming out on the streets and fighting, particularly in the case of Egypt the, the focal point of the movement was the occupation of Tahrir uh, Square and this was broadcasted live in the TV uh, screens uh, around the world and people caught on the idea that if you go and occupy the squares you can change your, your situation. And so the, this, I will say, was not necessarily the first expression of uh, opposition to austerity. In the case of Spain, before the 15M, there had been two big general uh, strikes, two big 24-hour general strikes. But this was the point where, where a large number of people, hundreds of thousands, uh, at some points millions of uh, people, came out on the streets to say uh, enough is enough, we don't want these policies, we don't agree. Uh, and, and there were two basic slogans which if you want kind of summarize that uh, movement. Uh, one is <laughs> we are not, um, we are not uh, goods at the mercy of the markets. Uh, and the other one was they do not represent us. And I will say that these two slogans basically summarize what I'm trying to say. First, the questioning of the capitalist system as an economic system that doesn't work, uh, that treats people as uh, goods that puts the profits of uh, private banks before the interests of people, and two, uh, they do not represent us, <coughs> meaning uh, no one represents us. None of these elected politicians, uh, they, they all the same and they do not represent us. We, we, we do not feel that these institutions represent the will of the, of the people. And, and this is uh, profoundly revolutionary. Uh, at the same time is, is limited in its uh, scope because it doesn't, it doesn't provide an, an alternative but any movement starts not with a finished idea of what it wants but uh, with a clear idea of what it doesn't uh, want and this is clear and we're talking here <coughs> not only about hundreds of thousands of people in Madrid but in towns and cities across uh, Spain, small and big uh, millions of people taking to the streets to discuss politics, to participate actively and so on the Russian uh, revolutionary Leon Trotsky wrote a three-volume uh, book on uh, the Russian Revolution, which he was one of the leading uh, figures of, and he said that the, the, the first or the, one of the main characteristics, one of the main features <laughs> of a revolutionary situation is when people do no longer delegate politics in uh, politicians, lawyers and uh, judges and so on, but they participate, they, they uh, enter 
uh, forcefully the arena of politics themselves. When people want to make politics themselves, want to decide by them by themselves. So I will say that there is obviously revolutionary uh, implications of such uh, a movement. In Greece it was a similar situation. In Greece they have been against the memorandums of understanding, against the austerity policies. I've lost uh, track now, but something like 25 or 30 days of general strikes in the space of four years, or four or five uh, years. The, the Greek working people, and particularly the Greek working class, has fought uh, as much as they could with the instruments and tools that they had at their disposal to try to stop these uh, policies. As a matter of fact, in the case of Syntagma Square, there, were, there was one point in which people attempted to physically prevent the passing of the Memorandum of Understanding in uh, Parliament. They, they were unable to uh, stop it. Uh, but in Greece there was also a movement, the movement of the squares, which involved uh, wide layers of society, particularly <clears throat> not only activists, i.e. people who were already involved in politics, who participated in campaigns and uh, so on, political organizations, but, but particularly people who had never been involved in, po <coughs> in politics before, they were participating for the first uh, time. People who might have regarded themselves before as middle class, uh, never voted for any left-wing political party, never participated in a demonstration, so on. They were now taking to the streets. Just to give you one example, in the case of Spain, uh, as well as these big demonstrations, in 2013, if I remember correctly, on the 26th of, uh, was it 26th of September, I think, there was a call uh, on social media for a demonstration that was called uh, Rodea el Congreso, Surround uh, Congress. Or at the beginning it was supposed to be called Occupy Congress, but then they, they thought this was a bit violent or confrontational. We we're just going to surround the uh, Congress. And this, uh, the call for this demonstration, listen to this, the call for this demonstration said, we're going to surround Congress until we get the dissolution of all established powers and we start everything uh, anew. This was the call, right? So this is pretty radical for any standards. They're not demanding that the government changes policy. They demand that the government, the government should be dissolved and that the people should establish new uh, institutions one way or, or another. This is not a questioning of one political party or one government or one corrupt politician. This is the questioning of the whole uh, edifice. Uh, and I don't know, it was clear that this demonstration was going to be, there was going to be violence on the part of the police, there was this one, the demonstration had not been allowed to go ahead legally. Uh, so about 40, 50,000 people uh, turned up, perhaps uh, more, which is already quite a significant uh, number. Obviously they didn't manage to get the dissolution of Congress or anything like this, but then, the week after, there was uh, an opinion poll in uh, El País, which is one of the main bourgeois capitalist papers in, in uh, Spain. And they asked people, do you agree with the aims of the Surround Congress demonstration? And 75% of the population said yes. This is the extent of the question of the capitalist uh, <coughs> democracy that uh, exists. Uh, but obviously, uh, just by sitting in a square for a long period of time, you don't uh, make a revolution. You, you don't change uh, the situation fundamentally. And people have learned from, from that. I mean, this was a movement that had an element of uh, naivety in, in it, uh, which is normal and is uh, usual in the first time that people participate in uh, politics. Any revolution starts with a carnival-like atmosphere of unity, we're all in this together, we can change things if we are united. And, and then people start to realize that it's not so simple, that uh, more things are, are needed. In the case of Spain, uh, all the bourgeois commentators said uh, it's needing to the 15M movement. They said, well, if you want to change things, uh, and if you are so sure about your proposals, why don't you stand in the elections instead of uh, going into the squares? And uh, then a few people decided to set up a political organization to stand in the elections. And now they're criticizing them for, and they are terrified of them standing in the, in the elections because they, they looks like they might even uh, win uh, the election. But in between 2011 and the formation of Podemos in 2014, January, uh, 
there were many other things that happened. I mean, th this is not a period of calm, it's a period of uh, intense uh, struggle. There, there have been uh, thousands of campaigns, thousands of direct action uh, mobilizations throughout uh, Spain involving millions of people. There, there's been what is known as the mareas, the tide, uh, which is the, the white tide against the, the privatization of uh, healthcare, the green tide against the privatization of uh, cuts in education, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, these are campaigns in which trade union activists are involved, but they are not run by the trade unions, they are run by, by, people, them, by people themselves that participate in the organizing and so on. And one of the biggest of such campaigns, and one of the most effective and successful, and has, has gained more prominence, is the campaign of the people who are fighting against evictions and home uh, repossessions by the banks of people who can't pay the mortgage uh, repayments or sometimes people who can't pay the rent because they, they lost the jobs and so on. And this is particularly scandalous in the case of Spain because the previous boom prior to the collapse of the economy was largely based on a, on a property bubble in which uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of uh, homes were built and there was speculation on the price of housing and so on. And so now in Spain, there are three, these are official figures, there are 3.4 million empty homes, uh, of which about 1 million are new built uh, homes that were built during this uh, period and they've never been uh, sold, can't be sold at the, at the market. And because the building companies uh, <coughs> have gone bankrupt, most of these homes are now in the balance sheets of the banks. The banks which are bankrupt and that uh, the state has bailed out. That is, uh, the state has cut education, healthcare, pensions and so on in order to pay the banks because uh, the banks have absorbed uh, the debts of these private uh, property speculators and the private banks a bailout by the by the state. This doesn't really make any sense. Capitalism is supposed to be about risk taking. If you take risk with your own uh, capital, you can get rewarded. But it seems you can never be punished if you lose your money for whatever reason. Then the state will come and bail you bail you out. This is very very. It seems that capitalism is very nice for for the capitalists. The privatization of uh, privatization of. Uh, profits and the socialization of uh, losses, this is what it is about. But this is particularly scandalous in Spain because the, the, the mortgage uh, law in Spain is, is, is really scandalous to the point where you, you can't pay your, you, can repay, you cannot repay the bank for your mortgage, then you lose your house, the bank auctions, the, but you don't lose your debt. The bank keeps, uh, seizes your property which you're supposed to be paying, and then they auctions this uh, property in the market where prices are now 40% lower than at the time when you bought this uh, house. And with this money that the bank gets in this auction or with the valuation of the price of this property, then they cover part of the debt. But the remain remainder of the debt is still your debt that you have to still uh, pay even though you don't have a house any anymore. And so in Spain, since uh, the beginning of the crisis, 500,000 families have been evicted from the homes by the banks, the banks who have been which have been bailed out by public by state, state uh, money and banks that are repossessing these homes when they already have a million empty homes in the in the balance in the books. This doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it does make sense from the point of point of view of defending the principle of private property and the principle of profit, private uh, profit, doesn't make any sense from the, from the point of view of the interest of the people. Because if there's 500,000 uh, families who have no homes now, uh, and the banks have one million uh, empty new uh, built uh, homes in the balance uh, sheets, I mean, this, uh, you just have to add one and, uh, and one, and you put people in the homes. And the slogan of this anti-evictions movement is precisely is precisely uh, this, no se entiende, no se entiende, eh, eh, casas sin gente, gente, gente sin casas, casas sin gente. Cannot be understood, there are people without homes, there are homes without, uh, without uh, people. And, <coughs> and the people have gotten organized throughout the country to resist, uh, physically resist evictions, as you can see in this uh, picture. In some cases they managed to prevent the eviction, some cases they haven't. 
but there's a big movement. And the other action that this movement has taken is also the occupation of empty building, uh, empty blocks to house people who have been uh, evicted from the, uh, belonging to the banks, to house people who have been evicted from their homes. Uh, so this is just one example, but there have been 1,001 struggles like uh, this in Spain and in, uh, in Greece. In Greece, for instance, we saw the heroic struggle of the ERT uh, workers, uh, public uh, broadcaster workers against the closure of the, of the place. There have been some cases, newspapers, for instance, in which the workers have taken over the premises and started uh, producing under workers' uh, control. I mean, this is not yet a big movement, but in the case of Greece, for instance, there are hundreds of thousands of workers who still have a job, but they're not receiving wages for months. Such, such is the, 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 the situation. And this finally has had a political expression. It has had a political expression in people voting for parties that almost didn't exist before, but that the, they seem to appear to be the parties that are against the payment of the debt, against austerity policies, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And also the collapse of the established uh, parties of bourgeois democracy. In the case of Spain and uh, Greece, the collapse of the uh, social democratic and right-wing parties that were the, the pillars of the bourgeois democracy for the last uh, 30, 35, 40 years since the 1970s in, in, uh, in the case of Greece and in the case of Spain, since the end of the dictatorship in both, in both countries. In the case of Greece, you see that in 2009, uh, PASOK and New Democracy were receiving 75% um, uh, basically 75% of all the, the votes, or, or over three quarters of the, of the votes. Syriza was getting 4.6%. Uh, it wasn't even called Syriza at that, uh, at that uh, time, but the predecessor of uh, Syriza. Uh, the Communist uh, Party, Kukue, was getting 7.5%. There's obviously been um, lots of changes in the political panorama in, uh, in Greece, but I have just put some of the most important uh, things that I think, think that are most significant in, in relation to this particular question of the collapse of the traditional bourgeois parties, <coughs> social democratic and, uh, and right wing, and the emergence of new uh, party. Uh, then there was the election in 2012. Uh, in 2012 there were two elections, one in May and one in June, in the space of a few uh, weeks, because the first election didn't result in a clear majority. Syriza jumped from 4 to 16 percent, but most interestingly, PASOK collapsed from 44 percent to 13 percent. At that time it was the worst uh, result, but there was worse to come. And uh, New Democracy also collapsed further. In the second election in 2012, New Democracy became the rallying point for all the supporters of the memorandum and therefore increased its votes uh, slightly. But also Syriza increased another 10, 10 points. And uh, finally, in 2015, in January, Syriza got 36%, becoming the first party in the country but had already been before the first party in the main uh, cities, the main, main party amongst all age groups between 18 and uh, 65 years of uh, age, with, with the only exception of the over 65s. Uh, the main party in all the industrial uh, areas, the, more, the working class areas and, and so on. And in the case of Spain, we have seen a similar but slightly different process. In 2008, just before the crisis, uh, the Socialist Party repeated its majority with 43% and 40% and for the Popular Party. These two parties at that time represented about 80% of the, of the votes, or over 80% of the, of the votes. In 2011, uh, the Socialist Party suffered a massive uh, collapse because this was the first party that was in government when the beginning of the implementation of austerity uh, measures. And the beneficiary was the Popular Party, which didn't increase its votes uh, much because there was an increase in abstention, but nevertheless managed to win the election with 44% of the vote. United Left, which uh, had been at one of its is, is, is a left party, is a left coalition around the Communist Party, which had been at its lowest, uh, almost lowest ever vote in 2008 with 3.8, uh, doubled or nearly doubled its uh, votes with 6.9 percent. In the Europe, and then in the European, uh, and then United Left continued to grow for a period of time, 
uh, they were polling at 8%, uh, then 9%, 10%, 12%, in some opinion polls they even reached 14%. And then the European elections in 2014 came with the first eruption of uh, Podemos. Podemos was formed on the 20th of uh, January 2014, so barely a, year, a bit more than a year ago by a group of people, most of whom had been uh, previously linked in one way or another to United Left. And, uh, <clears throat> and some of them were involved in a project where they had a, a TV station and they had a TV program, so they had achieved some prominence in that uh, way. Some of the main leaders of Podemos, particularly Pablo Iglesias, had been invited to political talk shows and it became very popular by uh, Answering, being very harsh in answering all the main uh, political commentators of the right uh, of the right wing in their own uh, terrain, and it appeared like this was uh, uh, it appeared very radical in its opposition to the status quo to the uh, establishment. Uh, but no one thought that they were going to go very far, myself included. I spent quite a lot of time between January and, uh, and uh, the first months of 2014 arguing with people. I don't think this is going to go anywhere. We're not going to. We're not going to get any results and so on. And, and all the opinion polls were showing that they, at most, they will get one European, uh, one member of the European Parliament in the elections, which took place when? In was it M March 2014 or May 2014? Okay. May 2014. So the party was barely five months old, less than five months <coughs> old, and it, and, it, and it was a big surprise. They got 8% of the vote. Most of the votes that they got were from people who previously abstained, uh, that said that they were not going to vote for any party, and a smaller number of votes from people who were previously voting for United uh, Left. But obviously, as, as they uh, emerged on the political scene, in, at that time, they became a serious alternative for, for millions of people and then they started going up in the opinion polls very quickly. Uh, in, in, uh, and the composition of Podemos vote uh, was clear, even if you look at the, at the European elections you can see that, uh, say for instance, in all the working class areas, towns and neighborhoods in the south of uh, Madrid is where Podemos got the biggest uh, vote, around 20% in uh, 15 to 20% in most of them. They got a big vote in traditionally left areas like Asturias, in the industrial uh, belt around uh, Barcelona. In, in all the traditional places where people vote for the left, uh, Podemos got the best, best uh, uh, results. And then, there's a key, uh, I put a couple of opinion polls that shows that Podemos has now become, in most of the opinion polls, though not, not all the opinion polls, but it's become the main uh, political force in the opinion polls. Obviously this has not been tested in any election uh, yet, but it's pretty significant that an organization that didn't exist one year ago is now uh, polling at the top of the opinion polls. Not only this, but particularly since the European elections, the bourgeois media in Spain has launched an unbelievable campaign against uh, Podemos. I, I have been involved in politics for a long time and the only other time that I have seen something like this is in the elections in Venezuela where, where Hugo Chavez is accused of everything and, uh, and everything possible and some things that are not possible in order to scare, scare away uh, people from voting for, 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 voting for him in the, in the past. And, uh, and they've accused, uh, they accused Podemos of everything, you know, they, they said Podemos, they are supporters of ETA, the Basque uh, terrorist organization, they are supporters of uh, Castro communism, they are funded by the dictatorship of uh, Chavez in Venezuela, and none of this has seemed to work, and, and then they started a campaign saying the main leaders of Podemos are corrupt, they have lied about the assets and this, that and the other. None of these allegations have been uh, proven, but it doesn't really matter if you repeat an allegation like this uh, enough, it seems that uh, they think that they will stick. But this has not worked, and, and, and the reason for this uh, has actually worked uh, in favor of uh, Podemos, because people are thinking, look, I mean, if these uh, bastards, to use a mild expression, who are all involved in corruption scandals, who have uh, caused this economic disaster, they are all attacking Podemos, Podemos must be something uh, good, surely. And there was one guy I, I, I saw, I think it was in a, 
in some comment, it was either in the latest page of a paper or in some, there was a bourgeois um, commentator who said if uh, Podemos wins the election, there will be economic uh, <laughs> chaos. It's a bit what they were, they were saying in, uh, in, uh, in Greece about cities. There will be economic chaos, massive uh, dislocation of the economy, will be expelled from the euro. And then this guy replied, well, look, I mean, uh, uh, a massive chaos in the economy, a uh, disaster we already have. Uh, so this can't be that, uh, but any change can only be for the, for the better. It doesn't, it doesn't really have a big uh, impact. Now, just to finish on one last uh, point, which is this, that uh, yes, both uh, Syriza uh, and the fact that Syriza won the election and uh, Podemos in Spain, in my opinion, reflect for the first, the first political expression of this massive opposition to austerity uh, policies. However, if one looks at the policies of uh, Podemos and uh, Syriza, in my opinion, these policies are flawed, fundamentally flawed, or in one respect. They, they're proposing a series of concrete measures, which are uh, all very good. No one can uh, deny these uh, policies, i.e. we need to put an end to austerity. Austerity is not working, uh, not working to recover the economy, it's not working to create employment and so on. We need different policies, we all agree on this. We need to put an end to, uh, we need to reverse austerity cuts, we need to bring back collective bargaining agreement in the case of Greece, we need to restore the level of the minimum wage in the case of Greece, we need to give people uh, access to basic uh, goods even if they can't afford them in the case of the, of the measures proposed by the Syriza government in Greece, we need to stop evictions of people from the homes, uh, these, these are all things that we all agree, we need to invest more in education, in healthcare, in uh, research and uh, development. But the problem comes when uh, the question is asked, how are we going to be able to do this? Where is the money going to come from? And you can see this, this contradiction very clearly in the last two months of the Syriza government in Greece. The whole, if you read the, the, the Thessaloniki manifesto, which is the manifesto that Syriza stood in the elections, and uh, a not very long document has been translated into English, you can read it by yourself. It says a whole number of measures that uh, everyone will agree. No, no one can disagree with this. I mean, uh, restoring the minimum wage to 751, giving uh, free electricity to 300,000 households who can't pay. These are all okay. These are all very good uh, measures. It wouldn't really solve all the problems, but it will go some way in changing the, the course of events. But then, it says we're going to achieve all of this through an agreement with our lenders, the Troika, the European uh, Union, the European Commission and the IMF, uh, in which we're going to say to them, first, we're going we're gonna to write off a large part of the debt, uh, and second, the rest of the debt we will pay, but we will only pay when we get economic growth in uh, Greece. This, this might seem uh, reasonable, even from a capitalist point of view. Because you, you put yourself in the, in the shoes of the capitalists in Germany, and everybody knows that if you have a debt to GDP ratio which is 183%, you're not going to be able to pay those debts. So you might as well reach some sort of uh, negotiated agreement, so at least you see some of that uh, money. First observation that needs to be made is that the bailout of Greece is no, not a bailout of Greece, it's a bailout of the, of the French and German uh, banks. 95% of all the money that is being given to Greece is not being given to Greece, but it's gone straight back to the, uh, to the creditors of, uh, of Greece. The second observation that needs to be, that needs to be made is that, uh, is that uh, the experience of the last two months shows that this is not possible. That this is not possible. That the Troika has not accepted any, any of these uh, reasonable uh, proposals which are within the limits of capitalism. Now, I, I, I fundamentally disagree with this idea, which is based on Keynesian uh, uh, economics, the idea that if you stimulate the economy through public investment, you will get a recovery and then uh, the whole thing will kick start again, people will start paying taxes again, people will have money in their pockets, they will spend and there will be a recovery of consumption and so on. I fundamentally disagree from a Marxist point of view, but, but let's say that this uh, might work. So why is it that uh, the Troika has not accepted any, any of this? Syriza, the Syriza government, 
uh, more specifically, Varoufakis, the finance minister, and the, and the prime minister at Cyprus have already backtracked on many of the things, many of these things. For instance, they're no longer talking about the write-off of the debt, which is part of this, the Thessaloniki problem. They're not talking about that. They're saying, yes, we will pay the debt, but only this debt has to be... Well, I mean, Varoufakis is a very clever guy who can think of technical ways in which this can be worked out within the limits of bourgeois law and so on. But they haven't accepted any of this. They have not accepted any of this. And they have insisted on every single point of the previous uh, memorandum. Why is this? I will say that there are two reasons. One which is economic and one which is political. As, a, as an economic reason, and, and the economic reason is that while the default of Greece, I, if everyone was to agree that Greece can't pay its debts and that's it, uh, this will not have a major uh, economic impact in Europe. First of all, because this debt is no longer owned by private banks, but is owned by public institutions, and it's a small amount of money in, in the general scheme of things. Greece is a small country with a small uh, economy in the whole of uh, Europe, that's fine. Uh, but first of all, uh, this could set a precedent for other countries to follow the same uh, road. And that's the political uh, reason. Who's been the st there's two political reasons. Who's been the strongest opponents of making any concession to Greece? Uh, not only Germany, and Angela Merkel obviously is not in favor of any solution that gives the idea that the uh, German taxpayers are paying for the Greek uh, debt because she has a party to her right, the alternative for uh, Germany, that is eating up into her electorate by uh, being more right-wing and anti-European and saying we shouldn't pay for any of, uh, any of this. So she's personally politically threatened. But who's been the main opponents of this? Uh, Portugal and Spain, particularly Spain. Uh, and according to some reports of these meetings, it was uh, Spanish... Uh, the Spanish uh, finance uh, minister, who said, no, we're not going to make any concession. And why is this? This is also for a political uh, reason. Because, you just imagine for a moment, that Greece is allowed to implement this program. I.e., that there's not going to be any more evictions, that uh, people are going to get, 300,000 households are going to get uh, free electricity and food uh, vouchers, uh, that uh, there's not going to be any more privatizations, that there's going to be a restoration of collective bargaining uh, rights, that there's going to be a restoration of the level of minimum wage to 751 euros, then uh, people in Spain are going to say, well, why Greece? Yes, and we can't do the same thing. And this will be the immediate end of the Popular Party uh, government that's promoting such policies. And the same thing in Portugal. And the same thing in Ireland. And not only that, but then the same thing will happen. They will put the, the governments in France and... Um, Italy under enormous pressure to change their, their policies. And not that they will change their policies, but they will create a mass movement towards that uh, aim. It will show that it is possible, that there's, a, a light, uh, there's some hope that this can uh, be changed. And this is the reason why they're not allowing uh, Greece to do uh, what, the people, what the Greek people uh, voted. Even though the program of Syriza wasn't particularly anti-capitalist or anything like this, it was a Keynesian program, Keynesian moderate program, of some pro including some progressive reforms and a commitment to pay the, 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 the most of the debt once there is economic uh, growth. There are many problems with that program, the, the main one being that even if that program is allowed to be implemented, there will not be economic growth in Greece. How can there be economic, on the what grounds can there be economic growth in Greece? Just imagine you are a, you are a Greek capitalist or a German capitalist, and Greece suddenly decides to increase the minimum wage from 500 to 700 uh, euros. Is this going to make you more likely or less likely to, to, to invest? I'd say less likely. You, you want a place where there's cheaper uh, uh, wages and so on and, and, and so on. A government carrying out progressive policies will scare away the capitalist. I mean, that's the nature of, of, of capitalism. What, what can you say? Particularly in a period of massive economic uh, crisis. There's not a single country in, in Europe where there's any significant economic growth, including in Germany. So how, how are we going to have Greece uh, spending its way or exporting its way out of the crisis? Who are they going to export uh, to if, if they manage to produce uh, anything in a significant way? But uh, even that program cannot be uh, implemented. And in my opinion, there's only three possible solutions to this, uh, to this uh, dilemma. 
And uh, the first one is a complete capitulation of uh, Tsipras and the Greek uh, government to the demands of the Troika. We have seen a partial uh, capitulation already with the 20th of February agreement, which basically reintroduces the Troika, accepts the government can do anything without consulting the Troika and so on, uh, spending limits and all that stuff. Uh, and this, which has not yet fully happened, uh, will immediately will lead to uh, the collapse of uh, Syriza, probably splits within Syriza, because there's, there's about 41% of the of the Central Committee of Cities that was already voted against the 20th of February uh, agreement. Uh, and the result will, will be, in my opinion, a certain growth for the Communist uh, Party, which has uh, opposed these uh, policies from the beginning, but also a general disillusionment of many people who put their hopes in this uh, government, and probably a rise of the right uh, wing, not necessarily the new democracy right wing, but other, other right wing uh, parties, including the neo-Nazi or the Nazi party, the uh, Golden Dawn. And this will be a, a disaster. It will take some time for the movement to recover from, from this. The second possibility is, uh, is what, I, what I will advocate as a Marxist. That you, you say, basically, you, you tell the Greek people the truth. Look, I mean, we, we stood on this program, these concrete measures, but this cannot be carried out in agreement with the Troika. The only way to carry out this program is by starting by uh, repudiating the debt. We're not going to pay this debt. We can't pay this debt. We're not going to pay this debt. Forget about it. And, uh, and therefore, we start building a program of emergency measures in Greece. But this will immediately lead to other measures. You have to nationalize the banks, impose uh, capital controls, and uh, over a period of time, also nationalize the main uh, companies, main uh, industries, uh, expropriate and seize the assets of all the main capitalists who are mostly tax uh, evaders and tax uh, fraudsters and, uh, and basically challenge uh, the rule of capitalism in uh, Greece. And this can only be done at the same time by making an appeal to working people in other countries to support this because Greece will come under massive attack from all the other capitalist countries in uh, Europe and can only rely on the solidarity and support of, of working people. And there is a third way. But the third way uh, is not really a third way because it leads eventually to all the other two ways, which is that there will be a fudge. There will be some sort of compromise uh, that the European Union uh, will say, OK, we will give you maybe a little bit of concession here. And the, the Greek government will say, OK, we'll commit to do all of this. And, uh, and this will last for, for a few months, maybe until July or whatever. And, uh, and then there will be another, another clash which will lead us to the first two possible uh, scenarios. And in my opinion, what this demonstrates is uh, that within the limits of capitalism, even these basic problems, housing, cuts, workers' uh, rights, cannot be solved in the present uh, situation. Let's say there was a vigorous boom of capitalist uh, development, like there was, say, in the 1950s and 60s in most advanced capitalist countries. The capitalist can uh, afford to make some concessions to the workers. And if the workers' movement is uh, organized enough, can, can gain some, uh, some uh, conqu conquests. But in the present uh, situation, this is ruled out. I mean, there can be temporary fudge, there can be temporary agreement, but uh, basically this, this cannot cannot go on for a very long period of time. And wh when we say that the room of maneuver is very limited, what we're talking about is a question of days. You know, I mean, on Friday, Greece has to pay, I think it's about 2 billion uh, euros back to its uh, lenders. But where are they going to find the money? And then the following Friday, or whenever it is, or the following uh, Tuesday after the following week, they have to pay wages and pensions for public sector uh, workers. Where are they going to find the money? There's no money in the coffers. Because also the first, uh, the first result of the, of the political turmoil, the, the possibility of Syriza winning the election, uh, the negotiations with the Eurogroup and all that stuff, is that I mean, investment has collapsed. There's been a massive uh, withdrawal of funds from the banks, a massive flight of uh, capital, massive collapse in tax uh, revenue. So the government is now in a worse situation than it was po possibly in December, uh, in, in December, in terms of how much money they, they have. So basically, uh, you can say, but what you're saying is, uh, is a bit utopian, isn't it? I mean, uh, I mean uh, challenging capitalism in Greece and then after that in the whole of Europe. But I will reply, if you, f if you can tell me 
a, a more reasonable and uh, serious proposal, I will, uh, I, for, for solving the problems of the Greek people, the Spanish people and the, and the working people around uh, Europe, I will uh, gladly uh, examine it and if it works I will uh, support it. But in my opinion there, is, there isn't any other solution. Uh, uh, within the limits of capitalism these things cannot be, uh, cannot be <coughs> solved. And this is my uh, contention. And, and just to finish, to say, that while these developments are very interesting, are very positive and very, in my opinion, <coughs> uh, give rise to uh, being optimistic, i.e. that in the past uh, four or five years, uh, millions of people have drawn very advanced political conclusions. In uh, these two countries, at least, they have uh, developed or set up, I mean, uh, Podemos, has gone from being an organization that was founded in January 2014 to an organization that now has 315,000 registered uh, members. They're not necessarily all active, but at some point there have been big assemblies in the local circles and so on, more or less levels of participation, depending on different things. Uh, this is quite uh, heartening because it shows that people are, are prepared to participate politically to change their conditions. Uh, I, I will argue that the leadership that they have is still not up to the task and they will have to put it to the test and develop an alternative uh, leadership, more radical or if you want a more reasonable uh, leadership that understands the limitations of the concrete situation and poses the necessary uh, uh, conclusions. And, and, and in my opinion the task of Marxist, of revolutionary Marxists is participate in this process shoulder by shoulder with the people who are fighting, who maybe have illusions in the wrong things, uh, but explaining patiently that in our opinion only the socialist transformation of society can uh, solve these basic uh, problems and trying to, through this debate, win over a majority in this, uh, in this uh, movement so that we can, uh, within our lifetime, transform this society uh, fundamentally, turn it upside down and uh, create a society which is based on the general interests of working uh, people who produce all uh, wealth and not in the interest of a small unelected uh, minority of parasites that uh, now rule uh, society. <laughs>